heavy achieve in battling against COVID-19. Along those lines, I know that they have more supply, more support, and the teammates to assist them in To make sure getting possible that care workers need. That includes protection. It includes testing equipment. It includes a mask. It includes gloves. It includes everything that our healthcare workers could possibly need. Uh, that task force is uh, working across the entire globe in search of those supplies. Uh, working along try to absorb those supplies. Now, one of my fellow Texans, and that is that in times like this, our fellow Texans always supply exactly what we're doing as it concerns the of our health COVID-19. So many people offered supplies. Others have shared their medical services to help people to tools and resources to respond to us. If others of you who want to assist in any way possible, it could be by supplies or offering their medical expertise to assist in responding to go to www.tech.gov. That's www.tech.gov. Go to that site, you'll see a red banner on there that you can click on where you can uh, find the location where you can volunteer your su volunteer supplies or, or volunteer your efforts to respond to the coronavirus. In addition to thanking those on the I also want to thank our fellow Texans, I want to know what you have been doing over the past one to two weeks to make sure we achieve our collective goal in the United States of America to slow the spread of the coronavirus. Your efforts to stay at home, to slow the spread, reducing personal interactions is truly saving lives. Health across the entire state of Texas, and it's doing it for thousands of people. The fact of the matter is, it's impossible to calculate the reduction of the spread of COVID-19, but know this, what you've done over the past week to 10 days is very real in the spread of COVID-19 in Texas. Listen, I've, I've seen the photos, I've seen the, the videos, and uh, as I've traveled in my limited travel, I said I've seen it personally, uh, in which Sidewalks are empty, the, the streets are empty, the parking lots are empty. Uh, places that used to be bustling are not. And what that means is that there is less communication from one to another that could spread COVID-19. The bottom line is you have made a difference, and we are to continue doing so. Now listen, by your efforts, you're, you're accelerating the timetable when Businesses will be bustling due to reduce the spread of COVID-19 now. The sooner that we all will be able to return to business as usual. Now, one thing that we are keeping on and that we are increasing is collection and testing capabilities for those uh, who may have COVID-19. There are, broadly speaking, three different types of groups administering the and the testing. One is public health. It could be the State Department of State Health Services, or it could be the local public health authorities. Another is uh, FEMA, provided uh, a massive amount of both collection and, and testing capabilities, especially in the larger urban areas. And some of these have been set up through these drive-through testing. 
And then, of course, there are the, the private providers and the private labs. The private providers could be your own uh, primary physician or any other physician that you see uh, at a private level. And then there are, are, are a lot of private labs uh, that are involved in the process of this testing. Through all of this, I'm proud to tell you that over the past week, as we have increased collection and testing by more than 1,000%. Here are the, the recent numbers that I have as of earlier today, understanding uh, that because testing is going on throughout the uh, entire day, these numbers may be changing a little bit over the course of just today. But the last numbers I have from earlier today is that 25,483 Texans have been tested for whether or not they have COVID-19. Of those tested, 2,552 are confirmed positive for COVID-19. There are now 118 counties in the state of Texas where uh, there has been somebody tested positive for COVID-19. There are 176 people in hospitals who are patients in hospitals who have tested positive for COVID-19. And there are 34 fatalities that have a connection to COVID-19. And when I say connection to, understand this, and that is these are people who may have COVID-19 but may also have a host of other uh, med medical ailments and they have medical ailments and happen to also have contracted COVID-19. Let me give you some very important information that you need to know about these numbers that I just gave you. On average, less than 10% of the people who were tested for COVID-19 test positive. Another way to say that is about 90% of the people who are tested for COVID-19 test negative, which means they do not have COVID-19. Similarly, of the people who are tested, uh, less than 10% of the people who test positive are going to hospitals. What that means uh, on the flip side is about 90% of the people who test positive for COVID-19 are not needing to go to a hospital. Now, most of these numbers that we've seen so far are the result of personal interactions before the distancing practices that went into place either through my executive order or through uh, local city and county orders that began either last week or even earlier this week. So hopefully uh, the numbers that we're seeing may improve in the weeks ahead even with increased testing. Another priority that we are focused on in the state of Texas that I know many of you have interest in and maybe some concerns about, especially as you see what's going on in places like New York and some other places in the country, and that is the capability of our hospitals to meet the potential demands that we may face in the coming weeks and months if there is a dramatic increase in the number of people who test positive for COVID-19. So let me share with you some numbers. We, we did an analysis about hospital beds that were available across the entire state of Texas. And the number of hospital beds available for COVID-19 positive patients more than doubled in the past week. Looking back on March the 18th, there were a little bit more than 8,100 hospital beds available for COVID-19 patients. As of March the 26th, there were more than 16,000 beds available for COVID-19 patients. And understand this also, most of that new capacity came online after I issued an, an executive order that was issued to, to end elective surgeries in the state of Texas. Importantly, that increased capacity does not include increased potential occupancy of rooms as a result of my other executive order uh, requiring the doubling of beds in rooms that are capable of having two beds as opposed to one. So what this means is that the number of available beds and rooms for people who may test positive for COVID-19 should be even larger than the number that I provided to you today. Know that this is something that we are monitoring on a daily basis. We will continue to provide you information because I know you want to know 
about the availability of hospital beds in your particular region, and, and we are measuring that also because we want to make sure we have capacity in the state of Texas to take care of the medical and hospital needs of everyone who may test positive for COVID-19 who needs to go to a hospital. Importantly, though, understand this. The number of Texans hospitalized with a connection to COVID-19 is less than 2% of available hospital room capacity. Stated otherwise, as of today, we have a COVID hospital vacancy rate of 98%. And so that shows that as of today, we have plenty of hospital capacity to respond to the needs of our communities for COVID-19 today. But here's the deal, two things about it. One is those numbers are the average numbers for the state of Texas and availability in one community may be greater than it could be in another community. And that brings me to one of my key points today. And that is our job is not to simply make assessments of where we are today and be satisfied with that. Instead, our job is to make sure that we're looking one, two, three, and four weeks ahead and make sure that Texas is going to be prepared to meet the needs of your communities if COVID-19 continues to increase across the state of Texas. As a result, for weeks now, we've been engaged in strategies to you know, figure out ways that we can begin the expansion of healthcare facilities to uh, make sure we will be capable of accommodating the needs of all Texans who may contract COVID-19. Very importantly along those lines, existing hospitals will continue to be the primary location to treat and care for those in need. But we must prepare for the worst case challenges as they arise. To begin that process, I deploy the National Guard Task Force Brigades to assist with healthcare infrastructure in Texas. That includes uh, General uh, Tracy Norris, uh, the general in charge of the National Guard here in the state of Texas, and, and myself. Uh, we have both uh, been working with Brigadier General Paul Owen uh, of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Their teams have been working to identify locations that could be used if current hospital capacity is exhausted. They looked at various different things, including recently closed hospitals or other pre-existing healthcare facilities. They looked at things like convention centers and arenas. And they ha have looked at hotels that are vacant now because people are not staying in hotels right now. The type of facility that will be needed will largely depend upon a certain region's unique needs as well as what facilities are available in that particular region. So for us to stay ahead in this process to make sure that your needs are going to be met, today we are announcing the first of these new facilities and based upon the consultation and advice of uh, the assessment of, uh, of facilities that are available, but also consultation and advice with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers about which location in which it is most needed. So given what we have seen about the current spread and escalation of the spread of COVID-19 in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, the location that we are announcing today is the K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center in Dallas, which will be set up to expand healthcare facilities. There are pictures of this over here, which probably are kind of hard for you all to see. Uh, but what it shows you is that as we gather today in the K. Bailey Hutchinson uh, Convention Center in Dallas, Texas, uh, there are already uh, very large-scale medical kits and equipment that exist in that convention center that all that is needed to be done uh, to be able to make sure bed space is available there is for those kits to be set up. So right now there are uh, there is the capacity in K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center for 250 beds with plenty of room to massively expand that number if that is needed. But understand this also, that uh, if we do have a massive increase in the num number of people 
who are contracting positive with COVID-19 who need hospitalization. We have the ability to go to other locations in the Dallas region. But understand this also. As we gather today and speak to you today, the state is working with the Army Corps of Engineers to lo locate additional potential facilities both in the Dallas-Fort Worth area as well as other regions where COVID-19 is spread the highest here in the state of Texas. So yes, we uh, will be looking at locations in places like Houston and San Antonio and Austin and the Rio Grande Valley, El Paso, in, in every part of the state of Texas where this need may need to be called upon sometime in the near future. But I want to reiterate a couple of things. We urge local leaders and owners of facilities to contact us if you are aware of structures or facilities that could serve as temporary healthcare facilities. If you have such information, if you would share it at that same website, which is www.texas.gov. That's www.texas.gov. And I want to reiterate that hospitals will continue to remain the primary location for care. Patients with acute needs will be prioritized and cared for at hospitals. Now, um, I'm going to provide the opportunity for the generals to speak more upon that here shortly. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, I will be issuing some additional executive orders today. Uh, the first executive order concerns travel. Understand that executive orders that are issued about travel is keenly focused on one main goal, and that is to reduce importing COVID-19 into the state of Texas. The best way to do that is to do all that we can to restrict travel into Texas from areas that have a high rate of COVID-19. One of those areas is our neighbor in Louisiana. It's well known, well documented uh, about uh, the massive amount of COVID-19, uh, not just now in New Orleans, but spreading out across the state of Louisiana. Well, my prior executive order about travel from New Orleans covered air travel from New Orleans into the state of Texas. Now I am updating that uh, executive order to also include travel by road. And it's travel by road from any location in the state of Louisiana. Importantly, this executive order does not apply to travel related to commercial activity, military service, emergency response, health response, or critical infrastructure functions. This order will be enforced like the order that I issued previously about travel from New Orleans. It will be enforced by the Texas Department of Public Safety at and near entry points from Louisiana. Everyone stopped by the Texas Department of Public Safety will follow the very same self-quarantine procedures in the pre-existing uh, order. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's it for travel from Louisiana. Now, as we all know, uh, since my last executive order uh, that put self-quarantine self centers into place uh, for those traveling by air from New Orleans to Texas, since that time there has been an increase in the number of hotspots identified across the country. Hotspots where it would be equally dangerous for people to be traveling into Texas from those hotspots. So in part in consultation with Dr. Hellerstedt, who is uh, the chief medical doctor in charge of this particular operation and in charge of the State Department of State Health Services, but also in part based upon uh, the doctor in charge of the uh, White House Task Force in response to the coronavirus, Dr. Deborah Burks. Uh, we are expanding uh, the executive order uh, requiring quarantine of passengers flying into Texas uh, to include more departure locations. They include Miami, uh, that would be Miami, Florida, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Detroit, Michigan, Chicago, Illinois, as well as any air travel from the states of California and Washington State. In addition to 
the executive order or orders uh, concerning enhanced restrictions on travel to Texas from other states. There's another executive order that I'm announcing today. It's an executive order to make sure that I as governor and that we as, this, as a state of Texas are doing all we can during this time of disaster to keep the state as safe as possible. So I am issuing an executive order to stop the release of dangerous felons from prisons and jails in Texas. I've heard from law enforcement officials as well as citizens alike who have raised concerns about releases that have already taken place or anticipated releases that could take place of dangerous criminals in jail because of COVID-19. The governor is charged under chapter 418 of the government code to maintain the safety of our state during a time of a declaration of disaster. Releasing dangerous criminals makes the state even less safe. That also complicates and slows our ability to respond to the disaster caused by COVID-19. We want to reduce and contain COVID-19 in jails and in prisons for the benefit of both the inmates as well as uh, the uh, law enforcement officers, the employees and the staff of those facilities. We've already worked with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice on solutions and we will work with all local authorities on solutions. But releasing dangerous criminals from jails into the streets is not the right solution. And doing so is now prohibited by law by this declaration. But let me say this. What Texans have done over the past 10 days as a demonstration of the way Texans always respond to challenges. We know that economically and personally, it is an enormous challenge for you to abide by these standards, to stay at home, to slow the spread, to make sure that you are doing your part, to make sure we have a limited expansion and, and we have maximum containment of the spread of COVID-19 in the state of Texas. You know, we are engaged in a war, a war that threatens your public health and the lives of some of you. The interesting fact about this war, unlike so many other wars, is you have all the tools that you personally need in order for you to personally win this war. You, you can protect yourself from being a victim of this war by you making sure that you reduce your interaction with others for a period of time to make sure that we will be able to slow the spread of the coronavirus in the state of Texas. You have in your hands that capability to, to stay home, to stay off the streets, to reduce your communication with others so that you will not be contracted COVID-19. And what we know also is this. This is not the first time that Texas is, has ever been tested by a challenge. We're, we're tested by challenges almost every year. We're tested by our hurricanes, by fires, by storms. And yes, we've been tested by infectious diseases like this in the past, whether it be H1N1 or Ebola or SARS, et cetera. Regardless of the challenge, Texans have always been up to that challenge. I know that here again, we will be up to that challenge. And I know here again, Texas will lead the way as we work our way out of this challenge and put Texas back onto the pathway of once again becoming the number one state in the United States for doing business and for economic vitality. But the sooner we're able to get there is gonna be dependent upon everything that you continue to do to make sure that you reduce the spread of the coronavirus in Texas. At this time, I'm gonna be handing it over and am I going to you first? Yes, sir, I think uh, you're going to the Corps first. All right, and we're gonna go to the Army Corps of Engineers first. Okay. Please. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate it for inviting us to participate in this event. And I think I just wanted to take a couple minutes to uh, emphasize some of the things you've already said. One is uh, over the last week, we've uh, worked very closely with the state, with FEMA, with Health and Human Services to create assessment teams that have been going out and looking at, at facilities that could potentially be used 
for alternative care sites. That uh, the formation of this team has happened very quickly, and I think it brings the best skill sets from all these different entities together to come up with the best recommendations uh, as we move forward in this. So we are uh, have we look we're look basically looking at three different types of facilities. There's hospitals that are uh, and clinics that are currently not in use. There are uh, arenas and convention centers, and there's also hotels that are all could be converted potentially into um, alternative care sites that could either be used for COVID. Uh, positive patients, non-COVID positive patients, acute care need patients, and, and non-acute care needs patients. So as the situation develops, we'll be able to adapt these facilities should it become necessary if uh, the cu current hospital capabilities are exceeded. So our, our assessments thus far have been focused in the DFW area with four specific locations to include the K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center, which looks like it could be rapidly um, should that need become necessary, expanded uh, to as much as 1,400 uh, beds um, capacity. Uh, looking forward, we do have assessment teams that are available to continue to do these types of assessments throughout the state. And, and as it becomes necessary, we look forward working with uh, the state, with FEMA, with uh, Health and Human Services to continue to provide this service to the state. That's all I have, Governor. Thank you. Well, uh, I wanted to personally thank you and your team for your effort. Uh, it, it's been amazing because uh, we only began talking about this uh, not too long ago. And uh, candidly, uh, your response time, your ability to turn this around to, to get it up to where it is today has been uh, remarkable in its speed and its efficiency. And it shows how quickly we will be able to respond, whether it be in Dallas or elsewhere, uh, to make sure that the needs of Texans are met. So thank you and your team for the quick response. Uh, and now for uh, General Norris uh, of the Texas National Guard. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Governor Abbott and community leaders have asked us to join the team effort with our em emergency responders throughout the state to assist in the response to COVID-19. Therefore, you will begin to see personnel in your community as we deploy to bring aid and assistance and do everything we can to help those in need. At this stage, we are prepared to meet the state's demand in any capacity as we adapt to daily changes in need. We have currently deployed three joint task force brigades, as Governor Abbott mentioned, and we're overseeing 10 general support units throughout the state of Texas. In addition, our engineer assessment teams are working hand in hand with the Corps of Engineers and our emergency partners. At present, we have been tasked with three primary missions, providing personnel and equipment to support control and logistics measures, providing communications capabilities for response operations, and providing medical support such as drive-through testing support and acting as a force multiplier for the medical community through expanding hospital capacity and providing equipment as we are able. We recognize that many people are not used to seeing the military personnel in uniform in their communities. However, remember that we are citizen soldiers and airmen. We truly are your neighbors and we are deeply invested in keeping our friends and fellow Texans safe. This is our home too and together we will get through this difficult time. We are Texans serving Texas, and together we are Texas strong. Thank you, General. And next we will go to Dr. Hellerstedt. Thank you, Governor Abbott. Um, the plan is very clear. We want to do two types of things. We want to increase the availability of hospital beds and all the other medical supplies and equipment that we need to address this problem. But equally important is we must continue the efforts that have been successful so far in social distancing and all the other preventive measures that we have. Both of those things are absolutely essential. I really want to put the emphasis as a physician and a public health official on the preventive part of it. And that's continuing to do the things that you see people doing. Social distancing, uh, hand washing, uh, cleanliness, hygiene, and the like. And we should really be proud of each other because we can see the evidence of this success when we walk out and when we drive around and see our communities and how much they've changed and how much they've responded to this challenge. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And uh, next, uh, someone who has not been at these events before because uh, he's relatively new to this team effort, but someone who is very well known around the Capitol, uh, and that is Dr. John Zerwas. Dr. John Zerwas, uh, until recently, uh, was chair of the House Appropriations Committee a longtime member of the Texas House of Representatives, but also a, a private practice physician uh, working uh, as an anesthesiologist. 
Uh, he has uh, unique knowledge uh, about some of the challenges that we're dealing with. And among other things, some of his core responsibilities that he's working on as we speak is to make sure that we will have an adequate number of doctors and nurses and healthcare facilities in our supply chain to meet the needs of Texans. I would like Dr. Zerwas uh, to provide some comments at this time. Well, thank you, Governor, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to serve with y'all. Uh, a week ago, uh, we convened uh, what we call the Strike Force, and uh, that included myself and Keith Myers and Clint Hart, uh, specifically to look at supply chain as well as uh, hospital capacity. And specifically, the hospital capacity was the thing the governor asked me to head up. Uh, I'm very pleased, as the governor said, we've already doubled the number of beds that could be available, and that includes ICU beds as well as ventilators, which are critical equipment to take care of patients. Uh, we are continuing to look for additional beds within the walls of the hospital. We know that there are probably as many as 30,000 more licensed beds that could be turned into beds that we could use for COVID patients. And, but on a hospital by hospital basis, we have to determine whether those beds really are suitable uh, to accept the staff that would be necessary to do that. So I'm pleased, Governor, with the pace that we're making. Uh, and I believe that uh, we are really in a good place right now, but we're gonna be in an even better place in the next few weeks. Thank you, Doctor. And now for uh, Nim Kidd, Chief of the Texas Division of Emergency Management. Thank you, Governor. First, I would like to start by thanking and continuing to praise our first responders and healthcare workers that are out there on the front line taking care of all patients, not just the COVID-19 patients. Second is to thank those state agencies that are not represented here that are wrapping and rallying to support supply chain logistics and distribution. And third, to thank our federal partners in the work of FEMA, the Department of Homeland Security, the Corps of Engineers, and Health and Human Services. This truly is a unified and a team effort as we move forward. And while the supply chain has been damaged, it is slowly starting to rebuild. Every day we are getting small amounts of personal protective equipment in. We will be distributing them within 24 hours. They will be going to various locations across the state. The method and model for that distribution is based on bed count with a small blend up where outbreak is. Our goal is to make sure that the right PPE is in the right hands at the right time. Also, lastly, again, one more thanks to FEMA and our federal partners. The pictures that you see behind us of the federal medical station that are ready to be deployed are but a small fraction of the resources that we believe we'll continue to get from them. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Nim. Before we go to questions, uh, I have been informed uh, that as I was talking about uh, the number of people tested and some other numbers, uh, that during that time period, uh, the feed was going in and out. So let me take just a moment to uh, make sure everybody uh, who is viewing this uh, once again knows the numbers of testing and bed availability. Uh, testing in, in the state of Texas for COVID-19 has increased about 1,000% over the past week. Bottom line is we are increasing testing dramatically. As of earlier today, the number of people in Texas who have been tested for COVID-19 is 25,483. The number of people who tested positive for having COVID-19 uh, is just about 10% of that 2,552. The number of counties in the state of Texas where there is a person who's tested positive for COVID-19 is 118. The number of confirmed patients in hospitals for COVID-19 is 176. And there are 34 fatalities that have a connection to COVID-19. Important information for you to know, and that is uh, about less or around 10% of the people who were tested for COVID-19 test positive. That means that about 90% of the people who were tested for COVID-19 test negative, which means they are shown that they do not have COVID-19. A similar percentage, about 10% of the people who test positive need to go to the hospital for treatment, which means about 90% of the people who test positive for COVID-19 do not need to go to the hospital for treatment. And most of these numbers were uh, the result of personal interactions before the distancing practices that began either earlier this week or late last week. Quickly, some numbers about hospital capacity, uh, which is our top priority right now. The number of hospital beds available for COVID-19 patients more than doubled during the last week. As of March the 18th, we identified about 8,100 beds that were available. As of March the 26th, 
we identified more than 16,000 beds that were available for COVID-19 patients. That does not include the numbers that Dr. Zerwas uh, talked about identifying earlier that, that may be available uh, on short notice. Most of the new capacity that we're talking about came online after the executive order was issued to end elective surgeries in Texas. And that capacity that I'm talking about, the numbers that I just gave you, does not include the potential for increased occupancy of rooms by doubling the number of uh, beds in a room, meaning that the number of available room beds should continue to increase uh, as we go forward. Importantly, if you just want to look at the numbers, the number of Texans hospitalized who have a connection with COVID-19 is about 2% of available hospital room capacity stated. Otherwise, as of today, we have a COVID hospital vacancy rate of about 98%. Our goal is to help you understand that where we are today, we have the capacity to deal with today's needs to respond to COVID-19. But the key part of our presentation and the reason why we are opening up the facility at the K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center in Dallas is because our goal is to focus on where we may be one, two, or three weeks from now in the event that we have uh, overflow needs from our hospitals at the local level. And importantly, just to make sure everyone heard this, and that is today we are announcing the opening of the facility at K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center in Dallas. We continue to work with other communities across the entire state of Texas to make sure their needs are also being met. Now we'll be happy to take your questions. I think that's very feasible, and I don't think that's a problem. I think that there's plenty of space at the K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center where you can uh, partition those spaces effectively to not have any conflict between those two groups. Uh, we did. We conducted assessments of uh, the Walnut Hill Medical Center, uh, which is off of uh, 75, and then we also conducted an assessment of the Embassy Suites on uh, on Stevens. And we also conducted uh, the Lumen Hotel, looked at the Lumen Hotel uh, in, the, in the area too. Sure. Uh, understand uh, that my future decision will be based upon the same analysis as my prior decision. Uh, if you recall, it was uh, more than a week ago where I issued an executive order uh, establishing the, the standard for the entire state of Texas uh, to close all bars and restaurants, keeping restaurants open for delivery, uh, but also closing all schools in the state of Texas, uh, re reducing if not eliminating any type of entry into senior living facilities, but also limiting any type of gathering of more than 10 people. Know this, that standard wasn't one that was drawn out of a hat. That was a standard based upon conversations with Dr. Helderstedt, uh, as well as it was based almost word for word on the standard that was issued by the White House Strike Force team in response to COVID-19. And that was in consultation with Dr. Birx, with whom, by the way, uh, as a governor, I have the opportunity to have conference, telephone conferences with uh, once or at least once, sometimes twice a week, where we get updates. That said, uh, it's my understanding uh, that the White House will be issuing an update may maybe early this week. Uh, we are awaiting to see what, if anything, they announce and then our analysis in the state of Texas will be based in part on what the CDC announces, uh, what the president's strike force team in response to, to, to coronavirus announces, and then in consultation with Dr. Hellerstedt. But just know that we constantly monitor this. We're, we're ready and flexible to take any action that may be needed to make sure that Texans remain safe. Uh, I, I do have the authority uh, to uh, ensure that schools remain closed for the remainder of the, of the calendar year or, or of, of the school year. However, uh, so what we're doing right now is this week I will be meeting with Mike Morath, the commissioner of the Texas Education Agency, and talk with him about his assessment of what needs to be done with regard to school closures, and then I will make a decision based upon consultation with Dr. Hellerstedt.
Well, let me tell you my understanding. Uh, my understanding is that when there was an agreement uh, between the United States and Mexico, uh, which was similar to the agreement between the United States and Canada, uh, it was intended to basically eliminate all non-essential travel across either of the two borders. It's my understanding that commercial travel was continued to be allowed and certain types of essential travel would be continued to, to be allowed, but with the same standard going both ways, meaning that the, the travel limitations on those coming from Mexico also apply to travel limitations of those going from Texas into Mexico. Uh, so w when we're dealing with uh, international travel, that the ability to constrain that and act upon that is established by the federal government. Would you repeat it, please? Does the state have any idea of the total number of ventilators available across the state? We are continuing to aggregate all the information about the number of, ven of ventilators and their location uh, to make sure we will have adequate supplies. We are also working uh, aggressively to add to the supply that we have. N knowing this, and that is we don't know right now how many ventilators we will need. We do know we have enough for our current needs, but our goal is to make sure we're prepared for what our needs may be two or three or four weeks from now. And as a result, we are, we are working uh, to look across the country uh, and across the globe to make sure we can add to our, our ventilator capacity. Uh, okay, wouldn't do a few more. They need to make sure that we need Texans to know what we're talking about. My decision with regard to the standard established by the state of Texas as an entity uh, is, is based upon uh, the advice and the instructions uh, by the CDC, uh, by Dr. Deborah Burks in consultation with Dr. Hellerstedt about what is appropriate for the state as a whole uh, for the best interests of public health and safety. And then we have seen uh, there have been counties and cities uh, that have enacted stricter standards and know this as we gather today, about 75% of the state of Texas uh, is under the umbrella of what would be categorized as a stay-at-home policy. And one thing that we are awaiting to see uh, is what is going to come out of the White House later on this week, where we, we, the governors have received a letter from the president after our telephone conference with the president on this last Thursday to expect some announcement this coming week about an alteration in the standard. So there's like first things first. The, the first next thing that will happen with regard to what I will be doing as governor is awaiting to hear what the, what the president and what the White House strike force and what the CDC will be announcing as what, if any, alteration is going to be made with regard to the federal standards. And then for Texas uh, to take that information, for me to talk with Dr. Hellerstedt and make a decision that is best for Texas. This is all driven by science, data, and medical assessments. You know, things like that are being looked at. Here's one thing that we're continuing to, to look at and assess uh, as we speak. We're looking at all of these federal dollars and programs uh, that have come down from Washington, D.C. In, in the bill that was uh, signed into law by the President on Friday. And we need to evaluate all the economic programs that are available. And we are, we are working uh, through economic strategies or, or business and finance strategies to figure out what the best solutions are uh, for people in the state of Texas. It is, it's hard to assess right now. Uh, I, I, get, I think the important thing uh, for state leaders uh, is to make sure that we do base our decisions on uh, the best advice of the medical professionals uh, about the dangers that exist out there. The worst case scenario would be this, and that is for us to open up businesses in two weeks 
only to have to shut them down a week later uh, because of a massive increase in the contraction rate of COVID-19. So we need to see something. Let me tell you this for people to think about. And that is we have a, a certain level of transmission rate uh, for, to, for transmission of the coronavirus right now. Because of the vacant streets and, and vacant stores and the vacant schools, there is the possibility that the transmission rate could decrease because there's fewer people to be able to transmit it to. Let us get a hold of the data uh, and of the medical conditions on the ground before we make these decisions. defer that to Dr. Hellestat, Commissioner, he probably would have a better uh, better angle on that. At present, I don't have any data indicating that that's a hot spot. Great. Listen, thank you all very much.